Now I am going to introduce you to Michelle Westmiss. Michelle is a disability advocate and mother to Aubrey. She's going to be leading our most highly anticipated discussion of the day, hearing directly from adults with Kabuki syndrome. Thank you and welcome Michelle. Hello there. It shouldn't have taken so long to get on stage, but here I am. I'm so glad to be with you today and to be a part of this really exciting session that I know everyone's looked forward to. How lucky are we to spend time and gather with our Kabuki worldwide family? You know, um, we found our people and the value of that is immense. The people who know the questions to ask, they know the answers that we need and you know, they know how to navigate this life with Kabuki syndrome. You might, some of you might know the books, what to expect when you're expecting. Those were the manuals I used when I was pregnant and raising my first child who didn't have a syndrome. And then when Aubrey was born, those manuals didn't work and all the rules for parenting didn't work. We didn't know what to do. I, we didn't know if she was going to see, hear, eat, walk, talk, and, um, you know, I didn't know what life would look like for her. How does a person live life with all of these complications and what would the future be? So, you know, we worked for her future. We connected with others who gave us power to think about the possibilities. But even as I was dreaming of the future and I'm the mama bear at the IEP meetings, demanding inclusion and open opportunities for her and all of the things, I'm still holding on to a little bit of fear, right? But something happened that was a turning point for me. And that was when I met Patty. So Aubrey's initial diagnosis was CHARGE syndrome. And Patty also had CHARGE. And as you know, just like with Kabuki syndrome, you know, no two people with Kabuki are the same and no two people with CHARGE are the same. But on paper, Aubrey and Patty were the same. I called them twins 13 years removed. We had found someone who was living with all the same labels, right? So at a conference like this one, except in person, I was able to sit at a conference table. I found myself at the, the final session sitting next to Patty. And I could imagine my future 13 years from now, this would be me sitting with my daughter. And you know what? It was okay. I could see the future sitting beside me and know that it was good. And so that really gave me more power. And it also gave Aubrey power because she met someone who talked like her and experienced the world like her. So, you know, then, then later we discovered at age 10 that Aubrey actually had Kabuki syndrome after having 10 years of being a part of the charge syndrome world. And, you know, that was shocking, right? Because our identity was wrapped up in charge. But then we found the Kabuki family and, you know, it's been beautiful. It's been the same kind of support and power we got from our charge family. We learned that a rose is just a rose. When the label changed, it really rocked our world. But we found out that labels don't change anything. The person is the same person. The situation is the same situation before the label and after the label, just as a, uh, a jar, con the contents of a jar don't change regardless of the labels you slap on top of it. So Kabuki gave us a new family and it gave us something else. It gave us information, access to service, services. We have an identity. Those of us here have a shared identity in Kabuki syndrome. We have family together. We're connected with researchers who care about the lives that we're living and the lives of our loved ones. And so we get to come together today and meet as a whole group and learn what the experts are learning about Kabuki. And we heard from parents about what it's like to live as a parent in a family with Kabuki syndrome. And now we get to hear from the adults that are actually living Kabuki themselves. And that is where we really find the answers that we're looking for about what is Kabuki syndrome and what does it mean to live with Kabuki syndrome. I know that after we talk to these young people, we are going to understand that people with Kabuki syndrome are way more than any labels attached to them. 
and that their life can be full of possibilities. And so I am really delighted to introduce to you and ask now for our young adults to go ahead and turn on their cameras. We're blessed to have Anna from Texas, Karen from Canada, Kevin from Illinois, Allie from Pennsylvania, James from Australia, and Rafani from Ohio. And they are all here to share themselves with you. So we're really, we're really excited that they're here and that they were willing to take that big step to put themselves out here for us. You guys are going to give us so much um, information and, and ideas for our own lives and our children. So first I am gonna ask if some of you would just tell us about yourself, where do you live, what do you do for fun? Just let, give us a little bit of who are you, right? Just the basic picture of who are you? So who wants to go first? I need you to raise a hand so I can see who's ready. I see that Karen is ready. Karen, go ahead and unmute and talk to us, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Karen. I am 34 years old. I uh, work as an educational assistant in the school board. Um, I've been doing this for about six years, maybe seven years. Uh, and I love what I do. I love helping people. I've also uh, lived on my own for the same amount of time, about six years, uh, maybe a bit longer living on my own in um, different scenarios of independent living. What do I like to do in my spare time? In my spare time, I like to go skiing, I like to go on walks, and I like horseback riding. Excellent. Thank you for giving an introduction to who is Karen. We appreciate yeah, it. And Anna, I see your name. You have your hand up. So if you would take your hand down and then tell us who you are. Hi, I'm Anna and I'm from San Antonio, Texas. Um, what I like to do is cheerleading and playing with my dogs. Yeah. Is there mm -hmm. anything else you want to tell us about yourself? That was quick. Um. I'm in 12th grade, so I'm about to graduate for college. What do you think you'll do after college? You have, I mean, after, after high school, what do you think you'll do? Do you have ideas? Either going to College Station or Arkansas. Nice. Okay. Thank you, Anna. And I see that, Allie, have, you can take your hand down and talk to us, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Allie. Um, I'm 20 years old. and. I have known that I had Kabuki my whole life. So um, I work at a daycare with the one to two year olds. And in my spare time, I love to listen to music and go on walks. Thank you, Allie. Kevin? Hello, my name is Kevin and I'm from Illinois. And I'm 20 years old, and I am uh, currently um, at Elmhurst University, which is a university around where I am. And I'm a freshman there, and I am studying communications. Very nice. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. And I think we need to hear from Rafani, right? Go ahead, Rafani. Okay, so my name is Rocky. I'm 25. I work as a cashier at Kroger and I like to watch hockey and I also like to write. I am a writer for fun. Most of my time is spent writing, basically. And yeah, I was diagnosed. I was clini clinically diagnosed. We don't have an actual like genetic diagnosis yet, but I was clinically diagnosed when I was nine and my first gathering when I was 12. Mm -hmm. And we've been to the last gathering within the Austin one, the last one down there a couple, about a month back or so. Okay, and, let, me, let me ask you a question. Yeah. Oh. One minute. Let me ask you a question, Rothany. Do yeah. you 
Can you tell us what it's meant for you to meet other people with Kabuki syndrome? I think it just gives me like a bunch of confidence to know there's going to be other families that are struggling, so they're just like, like wondering, like a bunch of the younger families and new like diagnosed children. I'm having a hard, I'm, hold on just a second. I'm having a hard time hearing your sound. And I want to ask if anyone else can tell me, are you guys hearing her fine? Or are you having trouble also? Karen says, no, you're not hearing well. So we've got Anna, Karen, um, Allie, Kevin. Okay. So folks, some of you, Karen, you talked about living different levels of independence. Can you tell us a little bit about that and and how how much support you had at the beginning, how much support yeah. you have now? Yeah, and actually today is a really exciting day for me because um, today I get my own house. With uh, me and my sister and my brother-in-law, we bought a house and today's closing date. So today we get the keys. So that's wow. currently my living situation. I'm gonna be in the basement. Them and their family are going to be on the main floor. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have my own kitchen and my own bedroom and my own entrance uh, downstairs, which I'm, I'm really excited about. But then if I get lonely, I can always go upstairs and see my sister and her family. Right. So that's what it looks like. It's going to look like in about a month and a half. Mm -hmm. uh, at the beginning, I had a lived-in support person. Mm -hmm. So it was me and two other individuals that also had a disability, and we had a lived-in support person. The two other people actually still live there, but me and my mom realized, hey, I don't need this. Mm -hmm. So give the opportunity to somebody else. Uh, and since then, I've been having support come on a weekly basis. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So well, you, really didn't need, that. you didn't need 24 hour support, but a little bit support every week is turning out yeah. to be, especially if you have somebody living right nearby, a really great neighbor who's even family. That's yeah. Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I actually have a support person and I see her about at least once a week. Mm -hmm. And we do fun stuff together. It might not be uh like work related or budgeting related mm -hmm. like this week we went to karaoke and that was really fun so yeah it, it depends on what your child needs and it 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 the child the person grows so the mm -hmm. support needs grow as well exactly that was very good to hear from you about how those needs have changed and yeah. let me move to kevin kevin Tell us your living situation and what kind of supports you have right now. Okay, well, so my parents are separated at the moment. So I live with my mom in her apartment because the house that she was living at is being remodeled at the moment. And I also live with my dad at his apartment as well. Right. And, um. I definitely have some support doing some things from like my parents and um, some other people as well. But at the moment, I don't have support from anyone else. Right. Other than my parents or teachers or anything like that. So when you go to college classes, are you doing that all independently without any any specific people helping you? Um. Well, I have like advisors and like teachers that help me, but like, right. and it is like a modified curriculum at the moment, but okay. I don't have like a one-on-one -on -one or what, what, there is a TA in there, but that's for like the whole class. Right. Wonderful. That's good to hear about from too. Now, yeah. I think Anna and Allie and Rothany, are you all young enough that you're at home and you haven't gone out on your own yet? Is that right? Yes. Rothany? 
So I am old enough to be on my own, but I kind of do live with my mom and my brother since work is just right that way. So I just easily walk to work and everything else. My parents are separated as well. Yeah. Okay. So your parents have, for everybody, your parents are your biggest supporter, but we know that as you grow, you'll need other support. And like Karen said, at the beginning, she needed a lot more. Now she needs an extra person just once a week or so. So um, what are some of the, uh, <laughs> excuse me, I have a tickle. That never happens when I'm on stage like this. Can you guys tell us about what you, you think your strengths or superpowers are that you bring to the world when you go out to do your work or you're in class or, or whatever? What is it that you bring to the world that is special and important? Kevin? Well, I feel like I have a lot of um, strengths or like skills I'm good at, but one of them is I'm public speaking and I really enjoy public speaking and I feel like I'm very good at it, but also is like, um, I, I think I'm a good writer as well. Yeah, I'm a good writer and yeah, I think those are some things that I'm good at. Oh, I think you muted. I am muted. Thank you, Kevin. Allie, what about you? I think that my superpowers are that I'm very kind, patient, and compassionate, which is like when I work at a daycare, like I'm very like patient with the kids because they can be a little bit um, testing sometimes, but I'm very patient with them. I think that you're muted. Michelle, you are continue to be muted. I keep, I thought I got it. You uh, sound like you've been the, you are in the place where you belong, Allie, where your yes. gifts are really used. Anna, what about you? So I always help with my friends at school if they need help. All the teachers ask me to help them at school. So another kind helping person. Mm -hmm. And Rafani? So I also have to have patience because I'm a cashier. And sometimes I deal with really rude people and I try to help them as much as I need to. Mm -hmm. And I can also and I'm also a writer by trade. And <laughs> I don't care. A, I haven't published anything, but I have a book right here, assembled right here next to me, which Excellent. I assembled last night into this morning. Okay, so we're going to want to hear more about that, especially when it's published. You know, you'll have a whole world of people ready to purchase your first book. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Karen? Um, I feel like the superpower that um, Kabuki has gave me, and a lot of people have said this before, it's patience and kindness. Uh, I liked how you started, M Michelle, with saying that the jar wasn't always, don't put labels on the jar, mm -hmm. because um, as I work with the kids with disabilities and adults with disabilities, I find that sometimes the diagnosis prevents them from not doing this. Well, so-and-so told me I can't read, so therefore I can't read. No, you can, just takes a little bit more time. You can do this, you just need to be, it's not gonna happen overnight. So I, I feel like Kabuki is giving me my passion, which is to work with people with disabilities. And Karen, I think that is one of the biggest messages I think, um, it's important for parents to know as they're <laughs> raising their children that mm -hmm. you all need to hear that you have gifts and possibilities, and then you need the tools to be successful and the opportunity to do it. 
Mm-hmm. I'm glad that you've discovered that mm-hmm. and then sharing that with others. And I think all of you are examples of that. You wouldn't be here if you didn't have people telling you that you were capable and had something to offer, right? Mm-hmm. No. We have a few questions from the audience. They would like to know, was it hard for you to make friends in school? Can you raise your hand if you'd like to talk about friends in school? Anna? I didn't really. Well, I have a lot of friends at school. I, w- I was in the general ed. Mm-hmm. I didn't have much, but now I'm in the special education. I have like a lot of friends now. So did you find it easier to make friends in special education than Gen Ed? Yes. Very interesting. That's good to know. That's helpful. Karen? I was in um, a spec ed class from kindergarten through into college. Uh, and especially in the high school years, I found it hard to make friends because I went to an old girls school and there was a lot of drama and I'm, I don't like that. Uh, mm-hmm. It's not the way, but I do have still a few friends from high school. But yeah, I, I feel like if I was in the gen ed, it might have been a bit different. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Karen. And Kevin? I feel like maybe like it was probably a little bit harder for me to like make friends. But then again, like I think since I have like a personality that like a lot of people like like, maybe like people look enjoy being around me and things, but like it is harder to be friends to make friends, but like you just have to like wait a little while and you'll make friends eventually probably. Do you have any tips for people who, do you have things that parents could tell their children to help them when they're working through some friend issues as children? Or do you have any advice you can Maybe. share? Go ahead, Kevin. Just look, tell them look, to look, be like themselves basically, not mm-hmm. like, like, be someone else for like their friends just because they want to be friends with a specific group of people doesn't mean you have to like be like those specific group, group that group of people I guess that's, that's great advice yes any other advice for parents to share with their children just, like don't be afraid to like talk to people and don't be afraid to like just like put yourself out there right even if you're nervous that that person might not like you. And if that person doesn't like you, then they they just don't like you for some reason. It's not like your fault, I guess. Right. right. And Karen, you have an idea to share also? Um, in terms of friendship, I would encourage some disincontro the extracurricular activities because um, a, a lot of my ex, a lot of my friends come through my extracurricular activities. Um, So yeah. I think that's important, Karen, because Mm -hmm. those are the places where you find people who share your interests, Mm -hmm. right? And our friends are people who care about the same things we do, who wanna do the same things we do. So when we're just put in a classroom with all the other kids our age, we may or may not have things in common, but in the extracurriculars where we've chosen to be there, then we can find our people. That's great advice. Yeah. Anna, do you have something else to share? To always be kind. Always be kind. Always be kind back. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully, right? Hopefully, if you're kind, people will be kind back. That's a great rule to live by. Allie? My advice would be to choose the kinder people to be friends with and to stay away from all the drama, the unkind people. Yes, exactly. I like that, Allie. And I think it's interesting that you and Karen both talked about avoiding the drama, right? Because my daughter didn't like that either. I remember one time we came home from a Girl Scout meeting and she said, Mom, I really love Girl Scouts, but I don't like those girls. (laughs) They're hard to be with, with all the giggling and the, you know, all the things girls do that that was challenging for her. That's interesting. Another question from the audience is, how did you feel 
when you first found out you had Kabuki syndrome. And I'm going to add to that, if you've, if you've just kind of always known, how do you feel? What does it feel like to be a person with Kabuki syndrome and to have differences and, and whatnot? You tell us, what does it mean to you? Rothany? So, so I was diagnosed when I was nine. I don't mm -hmm. really exactly remember like the actual day. But as soon as Kabuki is brought up, my dad decided to go ahead and look up online and go, yep, she's got that, yep, she's got that, yep, she's got that. And then also my mom, too. Mm -hmm. My mom is undiagnosed. She has symptom features as well, but she's never been officially diagnosed with Kabuki. Right. And, yeah, I think that's where so it comes from. what did it, um, did it have... Did you feel any certain way in knowing that you had Kabuki and, and that it kind of answered all the questions of, of what's going on here? Why do I have all these things? Not really, no. There was a couple of things I noticed that just there, you know, like, okay, I'm just gonna move past this. It's mm -hmm. just gonna go fly by. Just like, it was nothing, like everything was normal. Right. But yeah. It didn't change anything for you. Right, right. Very good. Okay. And Kevin? Um, I have, well, I was clinically diagnosed mm -hmm. with Kabuki syndrome when I was one years old. And I was genetically diagnosed with Kabuki when I was five years old. Mm -hmm. So I haven't really, like, known anything other than, like, having, not having Kabuki syndrome. Right. And, like, I I realized that, that some things were harder for me, but like I kind of just like I didn't like let myself get upset by it or I just like told myself like even though I have a disability, I can still like do things that like other people can do. It might just be harder for me. Mm -hmm. And how do, how does it how does it feel to walk through the world knowing that just having things be harder. Do you get tired of that sometimes? Is it yeah, personal? sometimes. But like, I just like try and tell myself like that it's okay and like things like that. I see my daughter sometimes getting frustrated just that she has to ask for help again. You know, mm -hmm. she wouldn't yeah, sure. do things herself yeah. a little bit more sometimes. Thank yeah. you for sharing, Kevin. Karen? Thank you. Yeah, especially at the beginning of me moving out, I hated asking for help because it meant that I was ashamed that I couldn't do it. Right. But now I'm like, asking for help is being the bigger person. Mm -hmm. Asking for help is saying, okay, I have this problem. I've stayed calm. I've tried to work it through it by myself. And it hasn't helped. It hasn't worked. So uh, I, I need more help. I like what you said about I've stayed calm and yeah. tried to find the answers myself. Staying that, calm is the hard part, I think, sometimes. That took a long time, but staying calm is uh, very important. Yeah. Right. And I when think, you're calm, then you can rationalize the problem. But if you're frustrated or upset, you can't rationalize the problem. Right. You can't think it through. No. And I think I I hear a lot of parents of younger children who see their child getting frustrated a lot mm -hmm. and they think it's going to be forever. Mm -hmm. So I think you're giving us some hope that, you know, over time, you and Kevin and Rothany have all said that you know, you can handle these things mm -hmm. and you learn to handle the challenges that you face without so much frustration and, and you're able to think it through and you figure out when it's you need to ask and when to keep trying on your own. Mm -hmm. Those are important things and, and important mm -hmm. for us parents to know that we can have faith that our kids are going to figure it out, right? Thank you for that. Allie, would you like to share something? Yes, um, I've always known that I had Kabuki, 
but um, I don't really feel any different from anybody else because um, I wear hearing aids and my parents always told me that um, other people wear glasses. So it was just mm -hmm. ears versus eyes. Right. I did have extra help in school, but I know that other kids did too. Mm -hmm. So, Excellent advice. Okay, I'm gonna, I see that James has been able to join us. James is in Australia where the time difference is a challenge. And James, we're so glad to see your face. Can you unmute and tell us about yourself? Hi, I'm James. I was born at, um, I was born with Kabuki syndrome. And I was, um, I was diagnosed at nine. Okay. I work on the, I also work at the Torquay Hotel now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think in your bio, James, you said that you, um, you have your own place, you live in your own apartment, and yep. but you do have some help, right? Can you tell us yeah. a little bit about the kind of help that, that helps you to be successful on your own? Sure. Um, I have what's called dropping support. And I also have community access where they, and they help me with my meal prep. And they also come in and take me out because I can't drive. They take me to work. They take me to appointments. They take mm -hmm. me to socialize Asian things. Yeah. Very good. So, so you don't have, there's not someone there all the time, but when you need it, there's people who drop in and there's people who get you the places you need to go. Yes. Excellent. How often do your people drop in? Uh, I usually have someone from nine in the morning till about seven or eight at night. Okay. So you have someone available all day. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Except James for when I'm working with because two hours a day. Okay. When you're at work. All right. Yeah. And we were just, before you came on, we were talking about what did it mean to you when you found out that you had Kabuki syndrome? And you just told us you learned when you were nine. Do you remember yeah. learning that? And, and do you remember how you felt about that? Uh, no, not really. But I do remember last time that I first, when I had the blood test done, mm -hmm. which was only 2020, which was obviously a more recent thing over here. Right. And yeah, I already knew I had Kabuki, so I was already prepared for that test to come back as mm -hmm. Kabuki. But I also found out I have a dis another one as well, which is micro deletion. Okay. Yeah. All right. And um, what do you, people are, are interested in knowing the biggest challenges of living independently? Um, just money, like managing my budget sometimes and right. not overspending. Okay, because and you have some kind of government benefits, I assume, in Australia. Yeah. Same way we do in America. Yes, I've got disability support pension. Mm -hmm. I've got the NDIS that funds my packages for my support staff and that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so thank you, James. Um, sure. Other folks, what do you think? Karen is on her own. Kevin is, a, all of you are approaching your, your new adults, right? Anna, Rothany, Kevin. When you look toward your future, what do you younger folks see as the biggest obstacle you need to figure out before you can get where you wanna be as an adult? Is there something, is there an obstacle that you need to, to solve before you can be on your own and successful in, in whatever way you want to be? Does that make sense to you guys? Do you know what I mean? Kevin, do you have an idea when you're thinking about yeah. moving forward? Probably like um, something that would be like something that I need to overcome would probably be, um, so 
I also have something called CVID, Common Variable Immune Deficiency. Okay. And And for that, I um get weekly infusions, mm -hmm. to, um, look on on my skin, mm -hmm. and it's every week by my parents. And I would like to learn how to do that, like independently, probably. Right, you'll have to figure out how to make that happen without yeah. your parents before you can can be independent from them. Sure, that's yeah. a big one. That's a big one to figure out. Yeah. Anne, do you have something to share? And around put to places since I'm not going to drive, how to make appointments and stuff. Right. Transportation is a big deal. Is there anybody on the panel who drives? Allie? Tell us about that, Allie. How did that work out for you? Um, I do drive, but I only drive short distances. Mm -hmm. Because when I first started driving, like after a few weeks of driving, I did get in a car accident mm -hmm. and I went off the road a little bit. Yeah. So. That happens to a lot of new drivers. It's not just you. So you, you're giving it a try, but you're taking it slow because you're not sure. You're not a confident driver yet. Yeah. Okay. What about Rothany? What do you think is might be your biggest obstacle that you're trying to figure out as you move forward? Um, definitely trying to get over my fear of learning to drive because mm -hmm. I do feel kind of anxious and nervous when I do. Okay. When I did get behind the wheel at first, I don't have the driver's license or anything. Okay. I do rely on my mom to get my dad, my mom, my brother to get around. Because right. I do have fear of getting behind with everything else. And I'm also short. I'm only five foot. So it's only <laughs> going to be harder for me to see the roads and everything else as well. Right. Right. So your vision is not an obstacle to you for driving. Right now, your biggest obstacle is your, your own fear and then just managing some of the little things like your height and and paying attention and those things? Oh yeah, definitely. especially with ADHD. It's definitely good. It's definitely like hard for me to pay attention. Okay, <laughs> very good. So um, what, for those of you that are taking classes in college, what are the classes you're taking and, and what are your plans when you finish that? So Kevin, I know that you're studying communication. Can you tell us about that and what you plan? Yeah. Yeah, so at the moment, I'm not taking any degree courses. I'm taking a lot of like beginning courses, like um, math, a math course, and then an English course as well, and then in ed coaching, which is basically like to help me like get organized, to help me like get homework done, things like that. Mm -hmm. And then next semester, I'm going to be taking my first like, degree course and it's interpersonal communications. And like, this is going to look, I'm going to see if like I actually like communications or if I have to find like another degree. Right. So you're, you've been doing the preparation and now you're ready to try <laughs> a credit class and see if, if you like it and how it goes. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Who else has thoughts about college? Raise your hand if you do. James, thank you. I'm, I'm actually currently studying a Cert three in hospitality in college. Yes. So Cert three in hospitality is like my RSG, RSA, so Responsible Service of Gambling, Responsible Service of Alcohol. I've just completed my alcohol, my gambling a few weeks ago. I've also got my barista's course, so I can do that now. Okay. So you, those yeah. are like um, credentials that allow you to yeah. serve alcohol, work in a gambling establishment, yeah. and do and barista work. 
work in a casino or a poker machine room, work in a um, bar type thing, work in a bistro, yeah. Right. All right. So you're putting together a little collection of credentials that will help you to be successful in hospitality. Nice. I've also been studying. I've also got my first aid certificate, Mm -hmm. which includes our basic and my basic emergency are uh, basic emergency, oh, basic life support course as well. Right. So if anyone in those in those places where you're working, you can help out if something goes Yes. Wrong. Yes. That's awesome. All right. Thank you, James. And Karen? You're welcome. <clears throat> College was really challenging for me. Mm-hmm. Because it was the first time that I'd been in a mainstream classroom and had a little bit of modified expectations mm-hmm. since kindergarten. Right. So it was really, at the beginning, a culture shock. But um, my mom especially, I could not have done it without her. She mm-hmm. was a great support. And um, the Center for Learning with People with Disabilities, they were great support. And I did it in three years instead of two. And yeah, so reduced course load. And I got through it. But that was one of the most challenging things that I think I've done. Yes, it sounds like it. And um, Mm -hmm. in my job now, I work with young people who are who are like at that place where you were just trying to do their first classes. Mm -hmm. And um, I think what you did taking extra time is good. And you went, you got more support than just what the college provided, right? Because what we don't think about is like you said, when you're in regular school, you have all those supports, right? And then all of a sudden you go to college and you're expected to just do it. And you don't have an IEP. No. They're, you know, they have they have things they do to help students, but not yeah. at all to the extent that they did at regular school. Yeah. I and remember reading a chapter of a book mm-hmm. and then going up to my mom saying, I'm so confused. Is this what he said? And then she said, yeah. And I'm like, why couldn't he just say that in one sentence? Right. Because college, yeah, it's a whole different thing, right? Yeah. It, higher level academics starts using bigger words and yeah. explaining things in depth. Yeah. yeah. So, so you were successful when you took extra time and got extra support besides yeah. what was at the school. Yeah. That's- and I also uh, got a tutor as well. So that was helpful as well. Right. And like Kevin said, he was successful or yes, Kevin, I'm getting, I'm, you keep moving around on my screen, y'all. So uh, mm-hmm. Kevin um, talked about taking some non-credit classes and kind of getting himself ready before he took his first communications class to see how that worked. Mm-hmm. So, all right, we, we've come to the end of our time together, but you know we're going to stay on and have some informal meet and greet time in a breakout session. So folks, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your life with us and giving us your experience and and sharing what you have advice for us, for us as families. And uh, Annie Dean is going to come back on, the co-founder and co-president of the Kabuki Foundation. And she's going to get us ready to go into those breakout sessions. So hang on here, guys, and we'll see you again in the breakout room. Hello, everyone. This was our most popular session for a reason. Um, You know, the conversation that we're all having on the side is just saying how cool you guys are and um, what we've learned from you. So thank you so much for sharing your experience. Um, Just for the record, James is in Perth, Australia, which means that it is 4.50 a.m. when he joined. Um, James, I've never woken up that early. So thank you. (laughs) Thank you for being here. Um, If it works for you all, you can all turn your camera off and we'll rejoin 
after the closing statement.